You're all very welcome this morning. If you're here as a guest or a visitor, then you're extremely welcome. And let me explain what's going to happen. We're going to spend some time worshiping together. That means we're going to sing some songs. We're going to say some prayers. We're going to read a little bit from the Bible. We're going to think about what it has to say to us. And then at the end of, of all of that, we don't go rushing out the door. We just take a moment or two to catch up with each other. There's tea and coffee. There's a chance to share life. We hope you'll be able to stay and enjoy that with us. There are lots of words that we use each time that we gather here. Sometimes we use too many words. But the words that we use, we use because they, they shape and define and describe. They not only do this in terms of what we do, but why we do it. And perhaps most importantly of all, who we are as we gather. So I want you to listen uh, to some words from the Bible. They're from the book of Hebrews that you find in the New Testament. And in chapter 11, the writer says this, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And then the preacher, author, continues, this is what the ancients were commended for. And what follows, if you go home this afternoon and open up your Bible to Hebrews 11, what you'll find is a long list, a whistle-stop tour of the ancients, the heroes of the faith, as we find them described in the Old Testament. And then, Having gone through a list, not an extensive list, but a significant list, as if to answer the question that we most commonly ask when we look at the Old Testament, which is, what has that got to do with us? Then the author writes this. Therefore, in light of all of this, in light of all these stories and all these people and all that we learn from them, about faith. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I want us to notice some instructions that are helpful for us as we gather to worship this morning. The first is that we throw off all those things that would distract us or make life difficult for us as we gather. So you've come in here with lots of baggage. I'm not talking about your handbags or your coats or whatever else. I'm talking about all those things that have weighed you down through the week, all those things that bother you, all those things that frustrate you. So let's throw those to one side. Let's turn our attention away from those things for just a few moments. And instead, let's fix our eyes on Jesus. And let's consider him. Because the author here gives us a purpose for doing that. So that you'll not grow weary and lose heart. January seems to be a long month. There's a sense of weariness. There's a sense of our hearts being heavy. Here's the response to that. Like many of you in this room, I drive a car. And regularly I need to stop at a filling station. If I don't, I run the risk of running out of fuel. Now there's more to our gathering than simply refueling. And I'm not talking about the coffee and the bickies, by the way. Nevertheless, refueling is an important aspect of our gathering in Jesus' name. We come to have our faith renewed. We come to be encouraged 
and we come to be inspired because our God is a great big God. And we're going to come together now and we're going to pray. So will you join me as we do that? Let's draw near to God with the confidence that God draws near to us. Father, we thank you for this place. We thank you for this space. We thank you for these moments when we can come and be together, when we can come and share life, and where we can come and be with you and know that you are here and share life with you and know that you share your life with us. We come to worship. And at times, Father, we know our worship is not perfect. We don't always get things right. We make mistakes. We fall short. We stuff up and we mess up. And we hurt ourselves and we hurt one another and we hurt other people and we hurt you. We come knowing that you have spoken through your word, knowing that you have spoken through Jesus, knowing that you continue to speak through your spirit, and knowing that you are a God of forgiveness. So we own up to all our mess, all our brokenness, all our failure. We own up to all of that, and we say, Lord, forgive us. Help us turn the page and start afresh again with you. So we ask that your Holy Spirit will come and be present in this place and lead us as we raise our voices. Lead us as we focus our hearts and minds. Lead us as we listen, not just with our ears, not just with our minds, but with our very souls to your life-giving word. May your spirit lead us. That all that we do together in this place today, that it may honor you, glorify you, praise you, and exalt you. And that we might know your amazing blessing. And knowing it, we might go from here to share that blessing in our families, in our neighborhoods, with our colleagues, with our friends, with whoever path we cross this week. So hear this prayer. And hear us now as we, a body of your people, join together in the prayer that your son Jesus has taught us to pray. Find the words on the screen if you'd like to look up. Let's say this together. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. And forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation but rescue us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to worship together now. We're going to use two pieces. One that speaks of faith. It's by faith that we know God, by faith that we live, by faith that we grow in our relationship with God. And then the second rejoices in the fact that God is the faithful one as we know him in Jesus. So we stand to sing or you can remain seated, but let's lift our voices as we praise God together by faith and faithful one.
Just before we let uh, Jam leave us for their time together, let's pray a blessing on them. Let's do that now. Father, we thank you that your love, your grace, your goodness is for all of us, and you value each one. So we pray your blessing now upon our Jam group as they go off to explore and discover more about you. May they have fun in doing so. May they learn just how big you are, but how much you love them. So bless and encourage them, we pray. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great, guys. Off you go. We'll catch up with you over tea and coffee and juice later. Have a lot of fun. Some weeks when I have to do the announcements, it can go on for quite a while. I can tell you this morning it's not going to, because what you see on the screen at the moment, he says, trusting that the person behind has pressed the button, that's the only announcement we've got. We've got an afternoon service today at 3 o'clock, and uh, do spread the word. Um, we'll be meeting in Kirkara, um, and we look forward to, to sharing together in that service. And so without any further ado, I'm going to invite Julie to come and lead us in our prayers for others. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of this new day. And as we bring our prayers for others, please focus our minds on you. Our world is a very broken place, which upsets us greatly, but we know that it hurts you too. Please be with all those in Israel, Gaza, and Ukraine who are being held captive or who have been injured, and be with the grieving families of those who have been killed. Life seems very cheap, and the killing of innocent people seems to be so futile and yet it keeps happening. It is hard for us to see a way out of this conflict, but we know that you can make a difference, and we pray that will happen soon. We ask you to be near to all our armed service personnel, those serving their country in the Army, Navy, and Air Force. We pray especially for our former Assistant Minister, Brent van der Lind, as he serves as a Royal Navy chaplain. We know that his ministry can be challenging, but give him the words and actions to encourage those he serves with and to bring them closer to you. We also ask that you be with all those in the Merchant Navy who ensure that goods are transported safely across the world. Some of these people have been coming under attack recently by rebels and terrorists. So we ask you to keep them safe and protect their loved, loved ones who must be very worried about them. We pray for all PCI missionaries in many corners of the world. These people and their families give up so much to bring your message to those who have never experienced it. And we thank you for their dedication and love for others. Stand with them in the many challenges they face on a daily basis. We pray for our moderator and all Presbyterian ministers, especially our own minister, Alban. Be with them all as they help us to make sense of your word through their teaching. Be with Ben today as he brings your word to us. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with all those known to us who are receiving end-of-life care. Make them aware of your presence and give their professional carers and family members skill, strength and patience to always treat them with dignity and compassion. We pray too for those who are ill or waiting for a diagnosis. Give them the hope they need and if the news is not good and positivity seems difficult, remind them that with your strength, they can face whatever is in front of them. We pray also for the children and young people in this congregation and those known to us. 
Show us all how to play our part in helping them to grow and develop as individuals and as young adults, and help us to show them how to be good followers of Jesus by our words and actions. Be with them and their parents as they try to nav navigate the exciting but often dangerous online world. We ask you to be with all the children who received test results yesterday, which will determine where they will go for the next stage of their education. Remind them that they are loved and that test results do not have to determine the rest of their lives. You are in control. Please be with all the people here who take on roles or responsibilities of any kind which help to keep this church functioning, whether those roles are leadership, administrative or practical. They are all important and should be valued as such. Over the last couple of weeks, we have had weather which has been challenging for many. Please be with the farmers who have to go out to feed and care for their animals, whatever the weather. For long distance lorry drivers who transport our food and other essential goods. And for the engineers who have to go out in all weathers to repair power lines and often find themselves in dangerous and very unpleasant places. Please don't allow us to take these people for granted. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Julie. We're going to stand and we're going to worship again as we use the words, uh, Lord, I come to you.
The reading is taken from Mark chapter 9. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet. And he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. <coughs> Amen. Good morning, everyone. Oh. Is that better? Or... Okay. Well, as we begin this morning, I want to ask you a question, okay? I wonder, have you ever put your faith in something that let you down? Have you ever put your faith in something that let you down? Put your hand up if that's you. I guess all of our hands should probably be up uh, today. And I wonder what comes to mind as I ask this. Is it your friends, your family, your work? Is it yourself? Or is it your sports team? Let me tell you, as a Man United fan, um, I've put my faith, my trust, my belief in the wrong places at times, in teams of such uh, terrible players that have produced such horrible results, and they've let us down, and a lot of all these other things, our friends, family, our work, and ourselves, they let us down. No matter how much faith we put in them, no matter how we depend on them, no matter what, they can't always help us. And that's because they all fail at some point, because they're human, they're sinful, and it's only natural. Today, we're thinking about faith and prayer, thinking about how Jesus calls us to have faith in him and to prayerfully depend on him and his Father, God. And last week, uh, Colin Neal took us through the Transfiguration, and we found ourselves at the top of the mountain with Jesus and the three disciples, Peter, James, and John. And we thought about how Jesus went through a glorifying and a galvanizing experience on top of this mountain where God 
confirmed again that this is my son. Listen to him. And the three disciples, they were with Jesus and they witnessed this. And they went through an amazing experience. But what is going on now in the verses uh, that Chris just read to us? Well, in verse 14, we see that Jesus and the three disciples are given a reality check, as it were. They're brought back down to the real world from this experience of glory down to the evil of the earth. And I guess as I was thinking about this, reading this verse, um, I wonder, I sort of brought this question to my head and I thought I would ask you guys, I wonder, have you ever had a time when things were going really great and you were witnessing something amazing, you were doing something amazing and then, bam, you get a reality check and you're back to the real world and you're back down to normal life. This kind of made me think about coming back from holiday. Do you know that feeling when you just had the, the best time away, maybe 10 days or so away with friends or family, and it all passes in an instant, those 10 days, and you're back suddenly to the normal nine to five, the usual day-to-day -day weekly grind, and you wonder, how did this happen? And I guess, in a sense, that is what Jesus and the disciples faced here, but on a completely different level. The beauty they had experienced with their own eyes has passed, and now they're back in the ugliness of the world. And it must have looked pretty ugly to them compared to the glory that they had just seen, the glory of the Lord. But Jesus is with them. Jesus is in control and he's ready and he's going to continue his mission, showing his authority over all things. In verse 14, Jesus finds the other disciples and there's a large crowd around them and this crowd, they're not happy. They want answers, they want Jesus and here he is. And Jesus is here and he's going to show everyone there that he alone has the authority to fix this situation. Not the disciples, not anything else, but Jesus. And by sorting out this situation, he calls the disciples to action. And today, through what we read, he calls us into action this morning. And I think Jesus is making two points in particular in these verses. And these are two points that make up our sermon today. What are the two points? Well, firstly, we will look at Jesus' call to faith. Jesus' call to faith. And secondly, Jesus' call to prayerful dependence. So firstly, Jesus' call to faith. In our verses today, we see faith and faithlessness on display. And that shows us something. And in this call to faith, we're going to think about two things. Firstly, the misplaced faith of the disciples and the unbelieving faith of the Father. But let's think about the disciples first. Jesus has arrived on the scene, and the disciples are in trouble. What's happening? Well, the father of this demon-possessed boy came to them to heal his son, but they couldn't. And you might think, why can't the disciples do this? Jesus, in chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, and chapter 6, verses 7 to 13, has sent out the disciples, and verse 7 of chapter 6 says, Jesus gave them authority over unclean spirits. So why, why can't they heal this boy? What has gone wrong over the six days that Jesus has been away? Well, it seems like Jesus knows the answer by what he says in verse 19, when he says, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? It seems the issue here with the disciples is a lack of faith or rather, faith that is misplaced. And Jesus' response in verse 7 tells us that he knows the disciples aren't able to heal this boy because they're trying to accomplish it by themselves in their own power. It almost seems like the disciples here have got too big for their boots. They've carried out a few healings, they've done a few things in Jesus' name, and now they think, I've got this. As they would say, or as we say in my house, uh, they've lost the run of themselves, maybe. They have forgotten who gave them the ability to heal. They have forgotten who they are working 
on behalf of. And Jesus, it seems here, is fed up. They have traveled with him for so long. He's done so many great things, and they still don't get who he is. They still don't get what he is trying to teach them. The disciples have faith, but it's only faith in themselves. You see, the object of their faith here is wrong. It isn't Jesus, and that's why it all falls apart, and that isn't good. And these verses just aren't here for us today to point fingers at the disciples and say, you know, look how terrible they are. Look at the lack of faith that they have. No, we need to realize this morning that we are like the disciples and we need to see ourselves in the disciples here. You see, we can be the same as the disciples. Our faith, it wavers all the time. We don't always trust in God. We don't always trust in him as much as we should. We can be like the disciples. We think, you know, I, I made a profession of faith maybe a long time ago, and that's me sorted. I'm good. But no, we need to continually have faith in Jesus and come back to him, recognizing that our faith is only possible through him and what he has done for us. But we don't always remember this. Like I asked you at the beginning, you know, we put our faith, our trust in other places, in people, our family, our friends, our education, our money, our jobs, and these things can be good things, but they let us down. They can't sustain us because eventually they all fade, but Jesus doesn't. If we look at this story, look at the story, look at our verses, Jesus is the only one that is in control here. He's in control of everything, the crowd, the demon, the disciples. In the chaos, Jesus knows what to do, and we should put our faith in him, faith that is only possible through Jesus. You see, our faith that we have, if we trust in Jesus, it isn't achieved by anything that we do, but faith is a gift from God, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2. And no matter how much faith that we have, we will never reach the point of having enough. Faith isn't like some money you put away in a bank. Faith is growing an ongoing process of daily renewing our trust in Jesus. And uh, Martin Luther said this on faith, and I think this is quite interesting. Martin Luther said, God our Father has made all things depend on faith so that whoever has faith will have everything, and whoever does not have faith will have nothing. The disciples, they needed a reminder in this passage, and so do we. So what should our faith be like this morning, and who do we learn from in this passage? Well, we see the unbelieving faith of the Father here. This Father has suffered, his Son has suffered, and they've went through a really, really tough time. You can imagine it must be pretty horrible, all the stuff that he has gone through. And this father comes to Jesus, and he's looking for healing for his son, but Jesus isn't there. So he passes this expectation on to the disciples, but they can't help him. They can't do it. And you can almost feel that this guy, this man, has tried everything. He's tried everything to heal his son, but it hasn't worked. And in verse 20, he finds Jesus. And Jesus has compassion on the man and his son. And we thought about Jesus' compassion already in previous chapters of Mark. And Jesus asked the man here, how long has he been like this? You see, Jesus actually cares about this boy. Jesus didn't need to ask this question. You know, he could have healed his son but he cares for him, and he shows his compassion, and he shows his authority here. And this father recognizes Jesus's authority. And what's interesting is actually, if you look, the demon does as well. What does the demon do when it sees Jesus? This demon has torn this son's life apart, and he sees Jesus, and when he does, he attacks the boy again. Verse 21, 22, he makes him have seizures. He throws him to the ground. He throws him into fire. Verse 22, trying to destroy God's beautiful 
creation. And this man has had enough. Verse 22, he says, Take pity on us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. You can see that this suffering that his son has went through has affected him as well. Help us, he says, if you can. If you can. And Jesus is a little taken aback by this. In verse 23, he says, you know, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. The father displays his unbelieving faith after Jesus says this in verse 23. And he cries out to Jesus and he says, I believe, help my unbelief. And that sounds maybe a little strange, but what does this verse actually mean? Here in this verse, we see true faith from the Father. We see that he has faith that Jesus will heal his son, and he recognizes within himself that he lacks faith at times. He lacks belief. He lacks faith. He knows that his faith wavers. He knows that Jesus is there for him, and he knows that despite his faith wavering, that Jesus is the one that he should have faith in. And he answers Jesus' call to faith here. And what happens? Jesus, he heals his son, and the demon never comes back again, and he's gone forever. This man, he recognizes that his faith isn't perfect, that it's weak, but he goes to Jesus. Jesus is the object of his faith and nothing else. This man knew to look to Jesus, and he looks to him after he heals his son, and he knows Jesus did what he said he would do. And what a challenge to us this morning, and what a challenge to the disciples as well. And don't we ought to have faith like the man in this passage? Haven't we also got to recognize that our faith is weak, that we need Jesus, that we need help? You know, when life is tough, we need faith in Jesus. When life is good, we need to have faith in Jesus. We need to go to him. We need to go to God's word, go to him in prayer. All of these things help us to continue to grow our faith and depend on Jesus. Not having misplaced faith in ourselves and other things, but the true object of our faith, Jesus. This morning, we also need to recognize that even when we place our faith in Jesus, that doesn't mean it's always going to be easy. And that's what verse 23 reminds us. And I'm sure you've heard this verse quoted before. This verse is one of the most in, or misinterpreted verses in the Bible. You know, people think when they read this verse that Jesus is saying that, you know, you can get whatever you want, that all things um, are possible. You can get whatever you want in life. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. Of course, all things are possible for God, but according to his will, and we don't know the will of God. He gives us not what we want, but what we need. And we don't have faith for what he can give us, but we have faith in him. We have faith in Jesus. So we saw in this uh, passage our call to faith. What's our second point? Well, Jesus calls us here to prayerful dependence. Prayerful dependence on him. And that stems from our faith in him. But where do we see this prayerful dependence? Well, in verse 28 and 29. We know that the disciples, due to their lack of faith in Jesus, have got it all wrong. And they haven't been able to help this man. And their lack of faith has had implications. And we see in verse 28 and 29, the disciples privately away from everyone else, probably all red-faced. You can imagine them all embarrassed that they couldn't heal this boy. And they ask Jesus, why can't we drive this out? Why couldn't we do it? And Jesus says in verse 29, this kind can only come out by prayer. The disciples, you see, thought they had power within themselves. And here they forgot to prayerfully depend on God. And Jesus uses this as a teaching moment for them, and he's teaching them that they need to realize that there is no substitution for prayer. And this morning, this doesn't just apply to the disciples, but this applies to us as well. But how? 
Well, we can be just like the disciples again. We can rely on ourselves and we can forget to pray. I wonder, what do you think about prayer? Do you think prayer is important? When I think of prayer, I like to think of this story. It's a story by, uh, about a guy called Charles Spurgeon. I'm sure you've heard of Charles Spurgeon. He's, one of the, or he's known as one of the greatest preachers of all time. But despite this, it wasn't his preaching that made him great. It was his congregation's prayers. That's what he said. And there's a story I read as I was preparing for this this morning about a group of ministers. They go to hear Spurgeon uh, preach one Sunday. And after the service, they ask him, you know, what is your secret? And Spurgeon replied, follow me. And Spurgeon takes them to the boiler room of the church, and he opens the door and he says, this is the secret. And he opens the door and he reveals a room full of people that are prayerfully depending on God, praying for the church, praying for all uh, that were coming to the church that day, that they would hear the gospel and be saved. And Spurgeon said about this, that this is the powerhouse of the church. This is the engine of the church. Spurgeon and his church viewed prayer as the most important gathering in the church calendar. And I wonder, that leads me to ask this morning, what is in the boiler room of our churches? I wonder, do we value prayer? Well, of course we should, because Jesus tells us here in verse 29. But we often neglect to pray. We neglect to depend on God. We like to rely on ourselves. We like to do it all on our own. This morning, we need to recognize that we can't do anything without God, that he alone has the power to make the impossible possible. And we need to prayerfully depend on Jesus and take every opportunity to do that together. It's great that we can join together in prayer meetings to pray. And I wonder, do we make it a priority? I know you have a prayer breakfast, and that is a great thing. What's not to like food and prayer together? It's lovely. Um, I want to encourage you that with this prayer breakfast, uh, maybe you don't go uh, to that. Maybe you can't make it along all the time. But I want to encourage you, maybe consider going to the prayer breakfast and joining together in prayer with all of us. I know we can't always attend everything, but I wonder, do we have the desire to go to the prayer meeting when we can? Or are our priorities maybe a bit mixed up? I know it can be a struggle. Uh, I think back to my time when I was in Hoth Amalahide uh, before, I was, um, before I had started the ministry process this year, and we used to have prayer meetings every Saturday morning at 7 o'clock. It's early. It's very early for me. Um, and especially, you ne I needed to leave the house at 6.25 to get there on time, so that meant I had to get up pretty early and get ready. And sometimes we can feel like maybe we need to drag ourselves to meetings like this, but in my experience, uh, we never feel like we have to drag ourselves away. And it's great that we can spend time praying together. Sinclair Ferguson, in his book, Devoted to God's Church, describes prayer as the Christian's native air. And he says that prayer should be such a part of us that it's like breathing. And I wonder, do we see prayer in that way? Does our faith in Jesus, our belief in him, cause us to depend on him in prayer? As the writer uh, R. R. Hughes says in his commentary on Mark, he says, a true test of our spiritual walk is our prayer life. Praying to God is important. And we can do that on our own, and we can do that together. And I want to encourage you, you know, prayer is one of the easiest things that we can do. We can talk to God anytime. We can talk to God anywhere. And maybe you think, you know, oh, I can't go to the meeting because I can't pray like those people with the big words that they say. I'm not going to say anything that matters. And I want to tell you, um, you know, growing up, I remember I used to be so scared of prayer meetings, going there, messing it up. And I knew when I was younger, 
Uh, if I had a prayer meeting coming up, I would sc uh, quickly scribble some thoughts on my hand before I went in to the meeting so that I had something to say. But I realized soon that this didn't matter. It didn't matter what I said because God was with me and God would help me to pray. And maybe you feel the same. Maybe you are scared of coming to prayer meetings or praying uh, to God because you don't know what you're going to say. I want to encourage you to listen to Jesus today and to depend on him in prayer. And he may not always answer our prayers exactly like we want uh, them to be answered, but he still hears us, he still acts according to his will, and he knows us better than we know ourselves, and he knows exactly what we need. We don't come to pray trying to get what we want, but we depend on God to give us what he knows that we need. As I begin uh, to conclude, I wonder, after today, will you answer Jesus' call to faith? Will you believe in him? Will you trust in him? Will you devote yourself to depending on God and not yourself? We don't want to make the same mistakes as the disciples did here. But let's also remember that even in the times that we don't pray, God is still at work. You see, God doesn't need us, but that doesn't mean that we don't bother praying, that we don't bother depending on him. He's the one uh, who does the work, and it's a great privilege that he allows us to take part. And may we always show our faith in to the world that we live. May we live it out uh, that others would know who we trust in and who we follow, and may we recognize that our faith wavers at times, that we can never have enough faith, and we may mess up from time to time, just like the disciples did, but that Jesus is with us. Jesus is with us, and he is the faithful one, so unchanging, like we uh, sung earlier. He intercedes for us at the right hand of God, and he bears with us in our mistakes. Let's look to Jesus this morning, the object of our faith and the object of our prayers. Let's ask him to help us grow in faith and that we would always depend on him, like the Father in this story. As we uh, reflect on uh, what we have just looked at in Mark 9, verses 14, to 29, uh, Neve and Ali are going to sing for us, and they're going to sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Tim, Ali, and Eve. That was lovely. Thank you. Let's uh, join together and pray as we reflect and respond further. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us today. Help us to have faith in you above everything else. When we feel our faith will fail, you will hold us fast, Lord. And we we thank you that you are with us. Lord, we're sorry for the times that we are like the disciples in this uh, passage where they put their trust in themselves. And we, we can be like them at times. We can forget about you. Lord, we know that we, when we do, uh, do this, that everything falls apart because we have no foundation in you. But Lord, help us to have faith like the Father in this story, that we recognize that a little faith is still powerful because it's in you and you are in control. Lord, we thank you that we can pray to you now. We're sorry for the times that we neglect to pray. Lord, help us to depend on you always in prayer. You alone can do the impossible, and we thank you for this opportunity that we have had today to reflect on you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for all that Jesus has done for us. We couldn't have faith without him. We couldn't have access to you without him. And we thank you for everything, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to finish today uh, with our final praise piece, Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death. So please stand and join me.
Bless you all. Thank you for that. Thank you, Ben, very much indeed for opening up God's Word to us. Let me, let me pray a blessing before we share some tea and coffee and life together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, 